Guys, um, I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Jacob, if you don't know me, and I get the honor and the privilege of talking to y'all tonight. And yeah, our big question for tonight is this, what is God's will for my life? And they're like, who is the wisest person we know to speak on this? And they're like, it's probably Jacob. Just kidding, no it's not. But before we get started, I want to pray for our time, and then we will begin. Thank you, Father, for this evening. Um, I just pray that, that tonight each of us um, will just desire to know you, will desire to, to understand you better, and to desire to be closer to you. I pray that we will leave this room uh, closer to you than we came in. And Yeah, God, I just, I just invite a spirit of learning here. Just, just, I just invite your spirit into this place that we would desire to be closer to you and know more about your word, God. Would you, would you posture our hearts in that way? Would you stir a passion in our hearts? Amen. Amen. So, with this question, what is God's will for my life? I think there's a few different responses that we automatically give when we hear this. Maybe, maybe right now you're hearing that and you're getting flashbacks to the five times you've been asked that already today. And you've just said, I don't know. And I'm tired of answering that question. Maybe you're full of terror and you're full of fear as you think about the unknown. Maybe you know. Maybe you figured it out. Which, good for you. Tell the people around you if you figure that out. Um, that's really great. But... I think for most of us, this question brings up some pretty strong and some mostly unsure emotions. Would you guys agree with that? Can I get a nod? You guys got to be alive for me. I'll get nervous if I'm not getting a response. Anyway, and it's it's because we're scared of the unknown. This causes so much anxiety and this causes so much fear not knowing what's ahead and wondering what God's will is because we're scared of the unknown. It's hard to sit calm and collected when you're headed in a direction and you can't see five feet in front of you. And as human beings, we get so anxious when we don't know what is next. I remember about three years ago, um, the last week of August, summer 2019, I moved into CBU for my freshman year of college. And any freshmen that just moved into college? Any freshmen? Oh, that's so fun. I hope your day was better than mine. We'll get to that. But um, I was pretty excited in those weeks and those months leading up to CBU. I mean, my, my brothers were there. I was excited for that. The school looked great. I was excited to be in the sun and in the heat all the time. And if you know anything about me, I changed my mind about that very quickly. But overall, I remember that my senior year of high school and the summer leading up to college, I was genuinely really excited to go to CBU. I was really stoked. But there came a point a few days before I was going to fly down that these emotions were no longer emotions of excitement. These emotions were no longer um, looking forward to what was ahead. I remember the day that my parents and I were flying down, there was just this fog of uncertainty in front of me. And I remember sitting in the Portland airport on my way to Ontario, my parents super excited for me, talking about all the great things that are going to happen, talking about our lunch plans for the next day, and they're so excited for me. And I remember just sitting there, faking a smile, assuring them of my excitement, when in reality I was terrified of getting on that plane. I did not want to go. And I began to think, my my mind started to race. What if I didn't look at enough colleges? What if I'm not ready to leave Oregon? What if I'm not ready to leave home? What if I hate it there? I've committed four years to this place. And sitting in that terminal on a day that should have been so exciting, I was so afraid of what was ahead of me. And then we landed in Riverside that night, and the next day was moving day, and we did all of the classic moving day things. Um... And it was, and I, I did pretty good. I was pretty distracted. And, you know, I moved into my room. I met some people, hung out with my brothers, um, did all of the moving day things that you have to do. And, I, and, I, and I, I kept away from those feelings for a while pretty well. But, uh, but later that night, I met back up with my parents for dinner. And in the quiet of the evening, with all of the distractions gone, all of those feelings returned to me, even stronger than they had before. And it, it was as if those feelings and those thoughts had been building all day unanswered. And now that it was finally caught quiet, they could speak. And sitting there at dinner, my stomach dropped, a lump was in my throat, and I was just flooded with anxiety. And I asked my parents very quietly if we could talk in the car. And so so, so we got up, we walked all the way to the parking garage at CBU without saying a word. And the second that I closed the back door of that car behind me, I just bust into tears. I just started crying like crazy. And my anxiety just took over. And I sat there in the backseat of their car having an anxiety, t- an anxiety attack and second-guessing everything that I had decided over the past year because I was so afraid of the unknown. I knew that if I stayed in Oregon, if I didn't go to CBU, that things would be familiar, I would have my friends, I would have my family, and things would be easier, and I was terrified to step into what I didn't know. And of course, fast forward three years, it was a good decision. I wouldn't change it for the world. But in that moment, I was so scared to step into what I wasn't sure about. 
And so today's question is, what is God's will for my life? And so many of us are asking that question on a regular basis, sometimes nonchalantly in passing, sometimes crying in the back of a Toyota Camry, because we're just so scared of what is ahead. And even if we're not scared, we just, a lot of us just really want to know, and for some valid reasons. In this room, there might be people wondering, what am I going to do after college? What career should I be pursuing right now? What major should I be in? Who am I going to marry? Will I get married? Where should I live? And here's the thing, though, guys. Here's the thing. We spend so much time asking, what is God's will for my life? But I don't think that's really the question we're asking. In the midst of our wandering about the future and looking ahead, we ask, what is God's will for my life? But what we usually really mean is just what's going to happen in my life. Because spoiler alert, our big question today what is God's will? It's not a hard one to ask. It's not a hard one to answer. Um, if we look at scripture, we can know what God's will for our life is. But the issue that we're facing today isn't finding out what God's will is more than it is the issue that we are much more concerned with knowing the details of where and who and when than we actually are with knowing the will of God. So I'm sorry, guys. I just want to apologize up front. Uh, I can't tell you what's going to happen in your life. You're probably not going to leave tonight knowing any better what career you'll do or who you'll marry or where you'll live. But a question that we can answer is the one on the screen right there. And that is, what is God's will for my life? Because it's in the scriptures. God has revealed that to us. So let's jump in the word of God and let's figure out what really is God's will for our life. So as we seek to answer this question, I want to highlight three specific things that help us understand and live into God's will. The first of these three things is that we would know Jesus. If you can write that down if you're taking notes, that we would know Jesus. God created us to be in relationship with him. He created us with the purpose of knowing us. And the first step to living into what he would have for our lives is genuinely knowing him. If we look at Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, and we look at Revelation, the end of the Bible, we will see that God's massive plan for all of the universe starts and ends with him being with his people. In Genesis, we see God with Adam and Eve in the garden in perfect communion and perfect relationship. And of course, we know that sin screwed that up. But if we look at Revelation and we see God's plan for redemption, we read this. It says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So the entire story that God is writing starts and ends with God dwelling with his people in perfect communion. And God wants the same for us in the meantime. If we trace the storyline of the Bible, starting in the garden, as we just mentioned, we can see throughout the entire book, God relentlessly wanting to be with his people, no matter what. We see, it, we see it in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve, and then with Abraham, and then with Moses, and then with the Israelites as, as they're freed from captivity and brought into the promised land. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we see God come to the earth in the form of his son Jesus in order to physically dwell with his people. Then in the book of Acts, we see God send the church, his Holy Spirit, and even today, God is with us in the form of his Holy Spirit, which is the power and presence of him on this earth. So we can see clearly from the beginning to now, and even to what is written about the end in Revelation, that God's will is to be with his people, and that his will for us is that we would be with him and that we would know him. And as we move forward, trying to know what God would have for us, and as we try to live obediently in what he would have for us, this first step is absolutely crucial. As Jesus says in John 15, um, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Guys, if we're not connected to Jesus, if we're not abiding in him, if we don't know him, then we can't expect to be bearing much fruit that will prove that we're living into God's will. Maybe you're sitting there and you're asking, okay, then, okay, what does it mean to know Jesus then? Like, I'll, I'll do it, fine. But what does that even mean? What does it mean to know Jesus? And to that, I would ask you, what does it mean to know anybody? If someone asked me if I know, if I know Grantham, I would say, yeah, I know Grantham. I, I spend a lot of time with him. I've observed the way that he acts, and I, I think I understand uh, the way that he operates fairly well. And it's not too different with our relationship to Jesus. To know Jesus is to spend time with him in prayer to observe the way that he acts and to understand the way that he operates, which we can do through his word that he has given us. So God wants us to know him and he has made himself known to us because he knows that connecting to him is the beginning of us living into our purpose and that if we don't know him well, then we have nothing. 
And just one step further, guys, he wants us to know him because he loves us. God loves his children. He has made every effort to save them and be with them no matter how sinful they are. And he strongly desires to be in communion with him. And this communion that we can have with God, the reason that we can know him is through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. Guys, point one is huge. God's will for your life is that you would know Jesus as your savior, as your Lord, and as your friend. Our second point as we unpack God's will for our lives is this. It's actually a direct result of our first step, knowing Jesus. Point two today is that we would look more like Jesus. God's will for your life is that you would look more like Jesus. The biblical writers make it very, very clear, especially Paul in the way that he writes, that there is an absolute and complete difference in a person between before they are saved and after they are saved. Before they know Jesus and after they know Jesus. That when we choose to follow Jesus and our sin is covered by his righteousness, we're not just saved on the inside, but the soul change that we've experienced should be clear and evident, evident to everyone because of our actions and the way that we live. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying that the, with the death of Jesus, his old sinful de- self also died, and now he lives in a new faith, in the faith of the Son of God. In Colossians 3, Paul writes something similar. He says that if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And finally, Jesus says in Mark 8, 34, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. All over the Bible, God is telling us that when we follow Jesus, our sinful ways are dead and buried and we are called into a new identity and a new way of living. And this way of living is in perfect obedience to God that Jesus modeled. God's will for your life is that you would know Jesus, but also that you would live like him and therefore that you would look like him. There's a whole lot of questions, guys, about what, that you have about what will happen in your life, these specifics. And I can't answer probably any of them. But one thing that I do know wholeheartedly is that God does not want you to be living in sin. He does not want you, if you have a new identity in him, he does not want you to be living in the, in the part of you that is dead, in the sin that is gone. That's not what Jesus modeled. God has given us a way to live, and he set the perfect example of living it in Jesus. And he wants nothing less than the same for us. If we look at, uh, Paul, at uh, Philippians chapter 2, After running through the timeline of Jesus' perfect life, um, Paul says that we're called to the same way of living as Jesus and that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the person whose example we should be following. That he is the perfect example of what we should do. Some of you know this about me, but I'm a a junior high intern here at the Grove with, is Derek here? Is Derek here? Derek has duty this night, doesn't he? That sucks. Anyway, me and Derek are interns together, but our junior high pastor is this dude named Jackson Jaramillo. And Jackson is not just one of my best friends and just an overall amazing guy. Jackson is a phenomenal leader, and Jackson is really good at being a youth pastor. Anyone that knows him would say that. And so with Jackson being so good at the thing that I also aspire to do, I not only spend time with him and learn from him, I look at his his example, and I try to be more like Jackson. If anyone had a favorite athlete growing up, they know know what this was like. You don't just want to learn from them. You want to be like them. It's the same thing with anything that we want to be better at. If we find someone who is good at the thing that we want to be good at, we should work toward the goal of looking more like that person. Would you guys agree with that? And it's the same with anything we want to be better at. And if our desire is to be obedient to God and to live out his will, then we should not only be looking at the example of Jesus, we should be working toward looking more like Jesus. Dallas Willard puts it great when he says that discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Grove, we are the the hands and the feet of Jesus. We are his representatives on this earth. And part of God's will for your life is that you would know him and that through knowing him and abiding in his spirit, you would be radically changed into a person that looks more like Jesus. The third and the final part of God's will for our lives that we can find in scripture is that we are called to live like Jesus. 
And if you're paying any attention, you'll probably notice that all of these things seem to revolve around this guy, Jesus, and you would be absolutely correct, it does. Um, God set the ultimate example of how a God-fearing human being should live through Jesus. And God's will for our lives is that we would know Jesus, and that because we know Jesus, we would become more like him, and that because we're more like Jesus, that we would continue his work and do the things that he did in his time on the earth. That we would be like him and do the things that he did. So what did Jesus do, though? We did a lot of things. And we can look at those things, and we can always return to the gospel to look at that example. But two main things that I want to highlight that Jesus did, that we are called to do as well, is that he preached the gospel and that he made disciples. The reason that Jesus came to this earth was to make a way that we could be saved from our sin and know him. And the way that we receive this salvation is through putting our faith in Jesus and devoting our lives to him. Once we've been saved and we've been made alive in Jesus, we're not supposed to just sit around and enjoy it for ourselves. No, we're called by scripture and through the example of Jesus to go out and spread the good news. And when this good news of the gospel transforms people's hearts, we're called to stay with them, teaching them how to follow Jesus and forming them into disciples of Jesus. There's so many stories in Jesus' ministry of him healing people and performing miracles, but all of these things serve the purpose of pointing toward the truth of the gospel with the purpose of that gospel being spread to all people. I mean, Jesus' final statement to his followers was exactly this. In the Great Commission, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And in Jesus' physical absence, we are his ambassadors, and we are the ones called to continue his work of sharing the gospel on this earth and of making disciples. So guys, as Christians, we're not just with Jesus and formed to be like Jesus. We must be on the front lines sharing the hope that we have and inviting people into the freedom that we have experienced. And not just sharing the gospel that we're saved by, but also doing life with others, teaching them all that Jesus has commanded us, and creating disciples that will make more disciples just like Jesus did. Go have young adults. God's will for your life is that you would know Jesus, that you would look more like Jesus, and that you would live like Jesus did, doing the things that Jesus did. God's intention for your life is that you would be transformed by him into someone who reaches the world for his kingdom. That is God's will for your life. So, we've clarified that. Is the anxiety gone? You guys feeling better? All, I, I'm assuming that all of the things about your future that you came in here with, that you were worried about, they're all gone, right? Right? I'm making a bad joke. No. That's not realistic. That's not a realistic thing that we can expect. That's not realistic for us. Guys, it's important that we shift our focus away from the question of what will happen and rather we focus on the question of what is God's will. And in doing this, we have the tools we need to focus on God's will and be faithful in the day that we are living. But the unknown still lies ahead. For some of us, it could be playing out right now like, okay, I know God's will for my life is to know him, to become like him, and to live like him, but I'm still anxiously waiting to figure out what I'm going to do after college. I know what I'm called to today, but I can't sleep wondering if I'm going to get that internship that I need to graduate. Maybe you're right there. You're saying, yes, thank you for these tools. Cool, great. Now I know how to live God's will. I just want to know if I'm going to get married or not. I just want to know if I'm ever going to find love. Someone here might be thinking that I just want to know if I should be investing in these relationships and these friendships or not because I'm leaving. I'm graduating. I don't know where I'll be. Guys, it's crucial to our lives as followers of Jesus that we know the will of God for our lives. But knowing God's will does not make these questions go away. They're still there. And we're well equipped if we seek the wisdom of the scripture, but we're just as clueless to what's going to happen next. Y'all, I want y'all to know that I was super convicted while preparing this sermon. Um, I decided a few months ago what I would be, what I would be preaching on, and I kind of I put off writing it because I was realizing that I was dealing with this. Writing this sermon and encouraging whoever's going to listen to care more about God's will than what's going to happen next, I realized that I was dealing with that myself, and my own mind started to race at all of the things that I don't know. Right now I'm dealing with, I'm a senior, which... My time's running out at CBU. I'm going to need a job. I don't know if I'll be in California or Oregon or Texas, because apparently that's an option for me now, too. Didn't think that would be a thing. But 
And I have no clue who I'll be in community with a year from now. And in the midst of trying to live out God's will for my life today, I'm just so anxious about what's ahead because I don't know what's coming. I don't know what's next. I have no clue where I will be standing at this moment in eight months. And that, frankly, that scares me. If I can just be real honest with you guys, that freaks me out. And I think that's something that scares a lot of us. There's this fear of tomorrow that is so strong that no matter how equipped we are, no matter how ready we are, no matter how much we're surrendering, we seem to always slip back into this type of anxiety. But grow up young adults, what I want you to know this evening as we hold these feelings in our hearts, is that Jesus knows this about us. Jesus is well aware of this reality. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves, and he is well aware that we are anxious people who don't like the unknown. Jesus knows that we're just scared children afraid of the dark. In fact, he spoke to a crowd of people who felt exactly like this about 2,000 years ago. And Jesus knew that the people of that time, and he knew that us, the grow of young adults gathered here tonight, are going to need some help with it. Jesus is well aware that tomorrow worries us, and this is why he spoke these words to the crowds that are recorded in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, if you want to turn there right now. But guys, before I read this passage, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that you are in that crowd. You're there at the Sermon on the Mount, listening to Jesus speak. You just heard him talk about all of these ways to live and you're doing your best to take in the teachings of Jesus that you're hearing, but you're just still so worried about the unknown. That thing that's in your mind right now is still there with you. I want you to imagine that you are in that crowd standing before the Lord Jesus, your mind racing about the future, and then he looks toward you and he says this. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which, which today is alive and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Or like how that one says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Guys, Jesus knows we're anxious. He knows that tomorrow is scary. And he knows that we have a hard time trusting him when we can't see it that far ahead of ourselves. But what he's communicating to this crowd, what he wants us to know today is that he is saying, trust me. Just do what I've said and I will take care of you. Verse 33 says this, says this perfectly. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Jesus delivered this statement of not being anxious after a bunch of instructions on how they should be living their lives. And essentially, he's saying right here, and he's saying the same thing to us, that you know my will for your life. You know what I've commanded you. I just told you all the ways to live. Now just trust me that I'm going to take care of you along the way. He says, do you really think that I care more about the birds than I care about you? Do you really think that I love the flowers more than I love you? Do you think I'm going to take care of them more than I'm going to take care of you? I know what you need. Seek first my kingdom, and I'll figure out the rest for you. Grow up young adults, it is absolutely normal for us to wonder what is next. But in order to glorify God and live in his, the purpose that he has given us today, we need to know his will, we need to live it out, and we need to trust in him to take care of us. Guys, we, we just can't know what's next. I wish that I could tell each and every single person in this room what's happening next and all of the best ways that you can prepare for it. If I could do that, I would stay up all night here with you guys doing that, but I just can't. 
And I don't think God's going to reveal those things to us until they happen. But what I can tell you is God's will for your life. And that if we seek to know him, to become like him, and to live like him, that he promises that he will be faithful to take care of us. Guys, I've had times in my life where I really thought that I knew what was next. Times when, times when like, I, I, I thought I had a breakthrough, and then I thought the fog just lifted, and I could just see the path. At one point, I thought I knew what my job was going to be after college. I thought I knew where I was going to live. I've even had thoughts, I've even had times where I thought I had an idea of who I would marry. But guys, guess what? I was wrong about all of it. Like zero out of 100, F, failing grade. I didn't get any of them right. And guys, and I've cried to God in my car driving down Victoria about all of those things. And every time I learned that I was wrong about one of those things, it was hard. And guys, I still don't have any of those questions answered. But what I do know is God's will for my life. And that he has made a promise to always be with me. And that that's where I find my peace. And that that is how I remain faithful in the day. So guys, as we wrap up, I want to invite the the band back up. But uh, I want to leave you guys with this. It's okay to wonder about the future. And it's perfectly okay to ask the question, what is next? But as followers, as followers of Jesus, we got to remember that living out the will of God in our lives is the most important thing that we can do. And that God's will for your life is this, that you would know Jesus, that you would have a saving relationship with him, abiding in his love and sharing in his righteousness, that you would look more like Jesus, taking on his traits as a result of your apprenticeship to him, and that you would live life the way that Jesus would, proclaiming the good news of the gospel to all the earth and making disciples that will make even more disciples. And as I close, guys, I want, I want to entertain this idea real quick. This, I'm going to be so straight up right now. This illustration might crash and burn, but we're just going to go for it. Who here likes the Lumineers? You know the Lumineers? You know the Lumineers? Okay. I know Grantham likes it. Grantham always gets mad that I don't like the Lumineers as much as he does. But anyway, you guys know the song? Okay. You guys know the song Sleep on the Floor? Has anyone seen the music video for that? Raise your hand if you've seen the music video for that. Okay, a few of them. Super cute. Super cool. Anyway, in this music video, there's this couple, and they're at like a, they're at like a funeral or something. Right, is it a funeral, Ellie? Is it a funeral? Yeah, it's a funeral. They're at this funeral or something. And then they're like, we're going to run away together. And then they run away together, and they go on this, like, road trip, and they do all this fun stuff, and they see all the, they, like, brush their teeth through their fingers, and they do all this cool stuff, and there's good times, and there's bad times. And as a culture, we love this idea. We love this image of, of, the, of the, the lovebirds that run away. They have no money, and they, but they go, and they just love each other, so they don't even care. Loggins and Messina said it well when they said, even though we ain't got money, I'm so in love with you, honey. Anyway, but as a culture, we, at least I do, we just like, we like that sappy stuff, right? Would you guys agree with that? We like, the, we like those stories? Anyway, I don't know why. Well, I kind of know why. But my mind, as I was writing this sermon, just went to this concept. And it went to that specifically, to that video. Of these two people that run away, and even though things are hard, and they don't know what's next, they don't even care because they're with the one that they love. And they know that the person they're with loves them too. Because in the same way, y'all, our, our lives in communion with Jesus, in relationship with Jesus, are full of mystery. It's full of unknown, and it's going to have plenty of hardships and things that you're not going to understand. But my prayer is that we would be people that don't care about that. Because we're with the one that we love, and that is Jesus. And that we would rest in the fact that we know that he loves us infinitely more than we could ever love him. My prayer for all of us young adults here is that we would truly seek the will of God, that we would know Jesus, that we would become like him, and that we would do the things that he did. And that as we go into the unknown, unsure of what is next, unsure, even if we can't see five feet in front of us, that we would rest in the love of Jesus. And yes, that love is even better than that weird music video. But but that we would trust in the promises that he has made and seek first his kingdom and know that he will take care of the rest. My prayer for us is that we would take the steps to trust God and understand that he will take care of us because he loves us so much. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for your faithfulness. 
God, I pray that, that our, our focus would shift away from what's going to happen next over to just wanting to know your will for our lives and wanting to truly live into that and truly be a part of that, that we would know you, that we would become like you, and that we would do what you did. God, I pray that, that everyone in this room that's dealing with something, that has that thing that they're so unsure about in the future, if their anxiety is even half as bad as mine is about it, God, I pray that you would just give them peace and give them, just give them clarity that they would know that you're with them. And even when it's unknown, even when it's unsure, your love is still there, you are still there, and that you promise to be with us until the end of the age. Father, we love you so much. Would we be a people who trust you? God, stir a passion in our hearts. We love you, Father. Amen.